Tuesday, Plus Sports and Plus TV Africa. My name is Wally Scott. Welcome on the show. Bukal Tinubu, good morning. Hello. Um, when you were young, I'm sure it happened to you too. It happened to me all the time. Your parents will beat you and continually tell you, don't be stubborn. This your stubbornness will mm -hmm. do you something one day, you know? And obviously, Gennot Roar, yes, the coach, yes. has proven to us times without number that he's stubborn. For those of you who don't know Chan, Chan is a competition organized by CAF for players who play their trade in their country's leagues. Mm. You understand that? The Chan players are doing very badly. And the guy is looking away like it doesn't even concern him. Like it's particular about the international players. We are begging him. We've been begging him for a while. Guy, they use this Nigerian based players once in a while too. Just give them the experience. One, they will do well in Chan. Two, is good for their experience. The guy has refused. And now he's, he's in trouble now. Yeah. Let, me, let me say the story for you guys to hear so you can know how much trouble Genoro is. Now, Super Eagles duo Tyron Eboe and Samuel Kalu will play no part in Nigeria's 2022 World Cup qualifier against Cape Verde today after the pair contracted COVID-19. Now, they were left out of the squad to face the Blue Sharks after being diagnosed with symptoms on Monday yesterday. A boy was expected to replace Ola Aino at a right back, while Kalu was up poised to take Elichie Nacho's role in the team for the encounter. Both players were isolated in Lagos and will undergo another PCR test in the coming days. The game against Skip Verd would have been a boy's 10th for the Eagles, while it would have been Kalu's 13th, scoring two goals. Nigeria defeated Liberia 2-0 in their opening group game, and will move three points clear of the Lone Star, who defeated the Central African Republic 1-0 yesterday. Now, should they record another victory over Cape Verde on Tuesday? That's today. My points. You had to have your uk based players go back. Ola Ino, mm -hmm. Kelechi Yenacho, Wilfred Ndidi, Alex Iwobi, they all went back. Mm -hmm. And then you had foreign-based replacements for them. And then your stubbornness will not let you use look um, home based players because just because you don't want to or just because you feel they're not good enough. And then the two foreign based replacements you have gotten for us have COVID 19. Mm. Obviously, as a national team manager, um, it's, it's your prerogative to pick whoever you want. At the same time, there are expectations on your performance at competitions. So you usually are supposed to go for the very best players who are in form and playing their trades in the best leagues yeah. in the world. That is understandable. But the uh, unique nature of our league, our in Africa, for example, and certainly South American um, footballers, who have to apply their trade in Europe in order to develop their skills because that is the best, uh, the best playing ground for football. But as a national team manager, you have the benefit of time. Can I ask you a question? Mm. My question would be, if I was to give Genot Raw a contract mm. to come and manage mm. the Super Eagles, one of the things, I will, one of the clauses I will put in the contract will be, in the course of doing your job, improve on our league to our Nigerian league. That's all we have to live for. Mm. I can't depend on an Alex Iwobi who can tell me tomorrow and say I have an injury when he doesn't have one. I know a Mikel Obi who, under Mourinho, will tell Nigeria that he's injured and then the next weekend he's playing for 90 minutes for Chelsea. You see, I don't have power over them. But how can you bring a coach to tell him, groom a team? Mm. I don't tell him, give him a clause and say, groom the Nigerian, um, the Nigerian League to while you are here. Now, where I was going with, with what I was saying, and I will properly cover your question. Um, as, a, as a national team manager, you have time to build up a squad and implore the right balance of uh, foreign and local base players. That, and competitions like Chan and the nature of um, the world right now with uh, COVID-19, allows you the time and at least even if your bosses are on your ass you have the opportunity to say well the circumstances being as they are i need to pick players who may be not as good but can at least fill out positions on the pitch now to your question first of all it's not it's up to the 
it is up to his employers, a NFF, to determine and make it manageable. Nobody has seen that contract before. Yes. But at the same time, developing and improving the league in Nigeria takes more than just picking a few players to play. Because at the end of the day, like I said before, a lot of our football is individualistic. True. So these players, no matter how big or how strong a squad he manages to put together and builds them to play team-based football, they will still go back home to their individual clubs. And those clubs will still employ them in different tactical um, setups that will require them to reform back, return back to form of individualistic football style. If you want to build a, a proper and improve upon the kind of football we have in this country, improve the league, you have to do what the English have done. You have to do what the Spanish have done. You have to do what the Germans have done. Even the, uh, the Americans have done. You have to improve at the grassroots level. You have to promote better coaches who go through our coaching system to get the very best out of our teams. And the players themselves have to Instead of trying to jump ship to Europe, to uh, Asia even, because that's where all the money is, because that's where be better football opportunities sure. are, you need to create incentives to keep them here, at the very least till they're 18 or 21, when they are at full maturity of understanding the philosophy of football that we have to offer. 18 or 21, I can assure you, let me tell you something today. This is not a joke. If a Nigerian player tells his 18 or 21, it's probably 30. Mm. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> really. This guy is called Oruru in Nigeria. Mm. His name is Cristiano Ronaldo. Mm. He sets the record and he breaks it again. Yes. I don't know how he does that. Uh, he sets the record and he breaks it again by himself. Mm. Cristiano Ronaldo is a, is a monster in his own lane. Untouched. No matter where you land on the discussion or uh, competition between him and Messi and every other great that has come before them, Ronaldo is so unique in his, in who he is as a footballer. A lot of people don't give him the credit because you know a lot of people say uh, Cristiano Ronaldo is not human, but Messi is an alien. Ronaldo, <laughs> Ronaldo is out of this world by by galaxies away. And he's a player that we never knew we needed in the game. If you were going to build a perfect footballer, Ronaldo would be it. Okay, now Cristiano Ronaldo broke Manchester United's daily shirt sale record in less than four hours. After it was confirmed, he will retain his iconic number seven jersey. The Portugal forward secured a long-awaited return to Old Trafford in August and is currently isolating ahead of his first visit to Carrington, expected to be on Thursday. As United confirmed Ronaldo will wear number seven on Thursday, fans dashed online to secure a replica, and it only took four hours to smash the record as the highest daily sale on a single sports merchandise site outside North America. Across the Fanatics network, Ronaldo became the biggest selling player in the 24 hours following a transfer to a new club leading Lionel Messi to Paris Saint-Germain, Tom Brady, to Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and LeBron James, to LA Lakers. Ronaldo sets the record, breaks it again. We're, we're talking he, beats about, fears, he beats everybody to shirt sales. We're talking about his shirt sales, and we're comparing him to LeBron James. His, his, the records he breaks at this point uh, transcend football. They go beyond... True. Football. He's he has the most followers on on uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter combined. He's he has had the very best paid contracts around the world, True. and he has some of the most lucrative sponsorship deals. The image rights that he has to offer to bring to any club, you're bound to benefit from it for years to come. Some guys are talking, especially board members, board directors. This could be gossip. But we heard that board directors in Manchester City are saying to Man United, shame. It wasn't about Ronaldo coming back. It was about business. Post-COVID, you guys are broke and you want money. Mm -hmm. And you will make the money. Well, take, it, take it if you want. Whether, you know? whether that is true or not, Man City have no reason to open their um, Qatari-based mouths <laughs> to talk about business. Making money, yeah. yeah. They signed... Um, naming rights deals for their Etihad Stadium, which, which broke laws that somehow they just got away with by paying, paying a small fine. They, they've 
positioned themselves and orchestrated their wealth to build up that squad in a way that no matter how much you hate the Glazers, they do it the good old-fashioned business-minded way. Can I ask you a question? Mm. Um, I want to buttress the fact that I just might agree with Man City. I'm a Man U fan, mm. blood and blood, blood out. But first of all, everybody talked about when they bought Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Mm. There was just um, that um, it was about business. It was more than money. Blah 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 blah. And Ronaldo is back. Come to think of it, let's be honest. Is there more business to this than play? I don't think Honestly. so. I don't think so. I think it's a combination of business, nostalgia, and good timing. Ronaldo is at a point in his career where he was at a club, Juventus, who had put all of their hopes on Ronaldo bringing them the Champions League. And Ronaldo did not disappoint in his performances. But while he sat at the top as the lead, the rest of the squad was in disarray. Tactical man, uh, management that wasn't proper. The, they brought in two different managers within two seasons who were project managers, who, who were tactical managers, and who were less pragmatic than Allegri, uh, Mourinho, yeah. uh, Ferguson. Managers that have gotten the best out of Ronaldo. And yet, that did not slow down Ronaldo's numbers by much. And at 36, Ronaldo still puts up numbers better than most 25-year-old strikers. True that. So even poachers... Even actual poachers are not putting up the kind of numbers that Ronaldo puts up. And at the very least, in the dressing room, so many of um, um, Man United players who have grown up in the academy have now the role model that they grew up on back in the dressing room. Mm. Now some tennis. Alexander Zverev beat Yannick Sinner 6-4, 7-4 six, to move into the quarterfinals of the U.S. Open as the fourth-seeded German extended his winning run to 15 matches. Enjoying a summer to remember. Zverev might have difficulty recalling the last time he lost the match after tapping into a run of form that has carried him to Olympic gold in Tokyo, a Masters 1000 win in Cincinnati, and the last eight at Flushing Meadows. Zverev will next meet on seeded South African Lloyd Harris, who stomped into his first Grand Slam quarterfinal with a 6-7-6-6-4-6-1-6-3 victory over our American Riley Opelka. Alexander Zverev. I think that's fantastic, really. Um, I have a, an argument today, and I think it's very insulting when people compare a man that was born in Brazil, played with a tin of milk in the streets of Rio de Janeiro, christened Edson Arantes do Nascimento, the whole world knows him as Pelé. I think it's insulting for people to compare Pelé to Ronaldo, to Lionel Messi. Mm. Why? The oracle of football is the World Cup. Mm. This man has won the World Cup three times. Neither Ronaldo nor Messi have won the World Cup. It is insulting to compare them. Well, error from, from error to error, it is certainly very hard and maybe unjustifiable to compare players from different errors. Um, obviously, we're always having arguments about... This one is past mark. It's exam now. Uh, uh, we are looking at what they've passed. This man has won the World Cup three times. No, no, the, these two legends, goats, have won the World Cup. That's enough for me. Well, it's I mean, exam. Simple exam. But this is... Ultimately, this is a subjective thing. Because when he won the World Cup for the first time, no South American country had done, gone that far. If your father wins a... Um, um, Get, get, gets a master's degree mm. from Harvard University mm. in 1945, mm. and you get a master's degree in Harvard in 2021. Mm. You both have master's degrees from Harvard. Mm. <laughs> Forget it out. Yes, but those are saying things like eh, things were harder then. It's easier now. No, no. I, the questions have to be. If things are even easier now because technology has taken over. These guys get regular supplements. The kind mm. of supplements that those guys didn't get then. Yes. It was harder to play football then than now. Yes, maybe on some levels, but it was also harder for defenders to catch up to you. Well, yeah. So now that defenders are on the same diet as strikers who are taking, participating in training, um, speed training that is similar to the strikers, who are playing with some of the very best strikers in the world and have access to some of the very best nutritionists and coaches who have accumulated the wealth of knowledge that started from the era of Pele to this very moment. There is, a, there is something to be said about 
the workload, for example, let's use the Harvard uh, analogy. Both of us go to Harvard in two different eras. True. But when you went to study medicine in Harvard, medicine was still very much rudimentary because you were still learning many of the things that we know but as But now it's easier. Now. There's internet, there's... Yes, but that is... Smartphones and all that. But that is... Then ease, it was harder. But that ease now means that I have to learn more than you did at, back then. Uh, the, uh, yes, you are learning more with ease. Now, an out-of-sorts Novak Djokovic has scraped his way to a 1-6-6-3-6-2-6-2 win over American wildcard Jensen Brotke on Monday. Now, to move into the U.S. Open quarterfinals and three wins from tennis immortality. Chasing the 21st major that would seal, seal a calendar year Grand Slam, Djokovic had difficulty getting into gear against the 99th ranked Brodsky, who for a moment linked, looked capable of dealing with the Serb. Now, fourth seeded Karolina Pliskova mounted a strong defensive effort to send Russian Anastasia Paluch. Pavluchenkova packing 7 6 6 1 in the fourth round of the US Open on Monday, keeping a tra on track a bid for a maiden major title. Djokovic, Pliskova barely scaled through, mm. but good for them. Yeah. Stuff champions are made of. Thank you very much, Mukai Tinubu. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, producer Toby Olushola. Join us same time tomorrow, same station, Plus Sports on Plus TV Africa. My name is Wally Scott. Like I always advise you at the end of every show, if not for anything, at least for your heart, do some sports.